This is Cerebral Cinema. Movies of the Mind. Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo present the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Starring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson and Tom Conway as Sherlock Holmes. Well, once again, it's time to keep our weekly date with the Dean of Storytellers, Dr. Watson. I'm sure he's expecting it. I am indeed, Mr. Bell. Good evening. You're punctual to the minute, as usual. This is one doctor's appointment I'll never be late for. Oh, that's very nice of you to say so, my boy. Uh, draw up your usual chair and settle down. <sighs> ah, that's it. <laughs> Fire in the grate, the lights turned low, and a wind howling outside. It's a perfect setting for a Sherlock Holmes adventure. Which one is it going to be? Well, tonight I thought I'd tell you a most weird and macabre story. Concerns werewolves on the wild moors of Scotland. And the strange happenings that took place in McKinnon Castle. Dear, dear, werewolves and haunted castles... My hair's beginning to stand on end already. Please get on with the story, Dr. In Watson. due time, Mr. Bell, but first, haven't you a little uh, business with our listeners? Business that also has to do with the uh, hair? Business? <laughs> oh, no, Dr. Watson, this isn't business. It's a pleasure. But thanks for the reminder. And I know you men will thank me again and again for this hot tip. Try Kreml hair tonic. Just notice how Kreml makes stubborn hair so much easier to comb. How your hair falls in place just where you want it and stays that way all day long. Now, be honest, men. Did your hair ever look better? You see, Kreml gives even dull, lifeless-looking hair a rich, attractive luster. It makes hair look so handsome and alive. Yet Kreml never glues hair down. It never leaves it looking or feeling greasy or dirty. Just try Kreml hair tonic once, and you'll readily see why it's such a nationwide favorite. Now, Dr. Watson, how about the werewolf? Well, Mr. Bell, the adventure began innocently enough on a slate gray November afternoon in Baker Street, just before the turn of the century. Holmes and I were seated comfortably on either side of a crackling fire when shortly before tea time, there was a jangle on our doorbell, and a few minutes later, a young girl, who Mrs. Hudson announced as Miss Victor, was standing before us. A young girl dressed in a wedding gown. She was in a great state of excitement. In fact, almost hysterical. Mr. Holmes, you must help me. There's no one else to whom I can turn. I, there, I don't know what there, to do. There, 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 my dear. Compose yourself. <laughs> if you will just tell us the facts, Miss Victor. Well, at three o'clock this afternoon, I was to have been married to David McKinnon. Any relation to the heir to McKinnons? The son and heir to the estate, Mr. Holmes. Oh, really? I think I met one of the family in a shooting party a few years ago. I remember distinctly... Some other time, Watson, please. Oh. Miss Victor's problem is immediate. Oh, sorry, Holmes. You say uh, you were to have been married, Miss Victor. <laughs> what occurred to prevent the ceremony? David just... just didn't appear. Oh, it was dreadful, Mr. Holmes. I waited and waited, and finally I knew he wasn't coming... You've had no word from him since? No, none. I went to his hotel as soon as I left the church. And what did you discover? That, that he'd received a visit from an elderly Scotsman this morning. And the porter said that immediately afterward they left together in a cab for St. Pancras Station. St. Pancras? Undoubtedly their destination was Scotland, Holmes. Quite. Oh, Mr. Holmes, you must find David for me. I know he's been kidnapped. Miss Victor... A man who is being kidnapped does not walk out of a hotel in broad daylight and order a cab. But something's happened to him. He wouldn't do a thing like this of his own volition. Are you quite sure that you didn't have some lover's quarrel, some little tiff in the last few days that might have made your fiancé uh, change his mind? Of course I'm sure, Dr. Watson. We've never had any misunderstanding. Only something dreadful could have made him leave. I shall do everything in my power to find out what it was, Miss Victor. Oh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Oh, uh, Watson, get me the railway guide. Oh, uh, there you are. It's on the table beside you. I knew you'd help me. I only hope you'll be successful. Ah. Now, Watson, if you'll pack a couple of bags and meet me at the station at 9.15 in time for the Scottish Express, I have a few simple inquiries to make. Oh, what, what, what kept 
took you so long, Holmes. We almost missed the train. You're shockingly out of condition, Watson. Oh, well. A little sprint like that shouldn't leave you so winded. Oh, never mind about my condition. Where have you been for the last four hours? Delving into the back issue files of the Times. Very instructive. You should try it sometime. Rubbish. There's nothing duller than yesterday's news. I doubt it would call the legend of the McKinnon family dull, Watson. On the contrary... Oh, so that's what you've been looking up. Yes. It's a history that goes back several hundred years of brawling and bloodshed. The founder of the clan was a 14th century Scottish warrior by the name of Wolfhound McKinnon. He is reputed to have been so incredibly vicious in battle that his enemies accused him of being a werewolf. A vampire? Oh, come now, Holmes. I'm merely repeating a 500-year-old legend. The point is that the present head of the clan, the father of the disappearing fiancé today, is known as Black Angus. He's a dominant, thoroughly hated man whose local reputation is as frightening in our day and age as his predecessors was five oh, centuries that's ago. Oh, very interesting, Holmes, but I don't see why you should get so excited over a 500-year-old legend. Well, you see, Watson, I found another rather curious fact in the paper. Oh, what was that? Several times during the last few months, sheepdogs have been found dead in the vicinity of McKinnon Castle with their throats torn out. Good heavens! <laughs> Thomas, you've lived in this village a good many years, I expect. All my life, sir. And this inn was my father's before me. We're interested in some of the local beauty spots, particularly McKinnon Castle. McKinnon Castle is no beauty spot, sir. Oh, really? Devil's Castle, we call it. There isn't a one of us in the village that wouldn't have been glad to see the ground open up and swallow the place. I and every McKinnon who lives there. Gracious me. Why are the McKinnons so hated, Thomas? There are no men... They're monsters. A McKinnon thinks that because he owns the land, he owns the air Amon breathes, too. And Black Angus is the biggest, blackest devil of them all. Black Angus? You mean the present laird? Aye. And if he keeps up with his devil's work, he'll be the dead laird before long. Give me how blood, sir, sir. What's been going on, Thomas? It's the sheepdog, sir. Hereabouts, a man sheepdog is his living. And yet six more have been killed in the past two weeks. And all of the poor wee beasties lying there on the moors with their throats torn out. How can you blame McKinnon for that? Surely some animal... Aye, been... sir. Aye. An animal that stands on two feet. What are you suggesting, Thomas? I'm suggesting nothing, sir. Except those dead dogs all had human teeth marks on their throats. <laughs> You insinuating that uh, Black Angus is, is a vampire? Oh, now, now, now. Really, my dear fellow. Oh, we've seen him at night, huh? when the moon was high, galloping across the moors on his big black horse. And the next morning, there's always been a dead sheep dog. You've seen him yourself? Well, well, no, sir. But there are those that have. There's no mistaking him with his big coat flapping and his hat pulled down over his eyes. What an extraordinary business. Interesting. Very interesting. Do you see that gentleman that just came in, sitting by himself in the corner there, sir? The man in the grey overcoat? Aye. His name's Humphreys. He can tell you more about the McKinnons than I can. He's a cousin of the family. And even though he's related and lives at the castle, he's as nice a gentleman as you'd meet up with. Thank you for the information, Thomas. I think perhaps we'll go and have a chat with him. Come on, Watson. Right, sir. Oh, uh, thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Glad to be of service, gentlemen. Excuse me, Mr. Humphreys. Aye. May we take the liberty of introducing ourselves? I'm Sherlock Holmes, and this is my friend, Dr. Watson. Uh, how do you do, oh, Mr. How Humphreys? Do you do? Do you do? Oh, won't you uh, sit down? Thank you. Thomas tells me you are a cousin of the McKinnon family. I am. Uh, do you know them? We're particularly interested in one of them, Mr. Humphreys. Yes, in David McKinnon. Ah, David's a very fine boy. You knew he was to have been married in London yesterday? Aye, I knew that. Did you also know that just before his wedding, he suddenly disappeared, Mr. Humphreys? Uh, gentlemen, may I ask the uh, reason for your interest in young David? That's a very fair question, sir. I have been asked by Miss Victor, David's fiancée, to try and find the young man. Oh, I see. Mm. 
Uh, it's a very unfortunate business. Mr. Humphreys, shortly before the wedding yesterday, David McKinnon had a visitor in his hotel. They left together, presumably to catch the express for Scotland. And poor Miss Victor was left stranded at the church. The little thing was, was heartbroken. Uh, she would be. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes, uh, I wish I could help you in some way, but... Uh... You can, Mr. Humphreys. Well, how? By telling us what message you delivered to David at his hotel yesterday. But I... Oh, come now, Mr. Humphreys. The man seen to be leaving the hotel with David was wearing a grey raglan coat, such as you are wearing. In addition, I observed as we sat down that you're reading yesterday's edition of the London Times. Even if you subscribed to it, it couldn't have reached you here in Scotland through the post this speedily. Amazing, Amazing. home. Elementary, isn't it, Mr. Humphreys? Well, I don't know about that, but... Uh... Your deduction is correct. Yes. yes, Mr. Holmes, I did return with David from London yesterday. What was the message you were sent to give him, may I ask? The message that decided him not to go through with his marriage? I'm afraid I can't answer that question, Mr. Holmes. Uh, though I may tell you, it's a family secret of the gravest importance. Hmm. Well, in that case, our only recourse is to go to McKinnon Castle and pursue our inquiries there. Well, yeah, I imagine that would be best, gentlemen, but uh, frankly, I doubt if you'll gain admittance. Angus is a willful man with a terrible temper, and when he knows you want to see David... We've he... handled terrible men before, haven't we, Watson? Yes, indeed. I remember that afternoon in Baker Street when Dr. Grimsby Royalt picked up the poker and was Yes, about Watson. To... You can regale Mr. Humphreys with that some other oh, time. Oh. But now I think we'd best be starting for the castle. Uh, uh, Mr. Holmes... If by any chance you do see Angus, I must ask you not to mention that you've talked to me. I, if he finds out, there might be trouble. All right, Mr. Humphreys. Come along, Watson. I wish they'd put some springs in this vehicle. It's worse than an Irish jaunting car. <laughs> if Thomas's directions are to be believed, we should see the castle when we get to the crest of this hill. This Black Angus seems to be quite a lovable character. Even Humphreys, his, his cousin, seems to be terrified of him. The man was positively shaking. Yes, I noticed that. Ah, that must be the castle now. I judge. Forbidding-looking place, isn't it? Yes. Watson. Rain in your horse. Well, back, well, back, well, back. What is it, Holmes? Look, lying by the side of the road. Just a dead dog. Yes, a dead sheep dog. Come on. Uh, the dog's throat has been torn out. Yes. And look here, Watson. Look at these marks on the throat. Good heavens, Holmes. They look like they are the marks of human teeth. <laughs> Hey, gentlemen. Is the lad at home? I'm sorry, sir. But the lad will not see people who will turn appointment. Uh, then will you please give him a message? But the tool... Tell him that Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson have come here from London to see him. Yes, my good man. And, and tell him it's on a very important and confidential business. If you'll wait here in the hall, I'll give him the message, gentlemen. But he'll no see you. He'll no see you. Stupid old ass. Anyone think he owned the castle? Watson, have a look at these two portraits. <laughs> a couple of grim-looking characters. Give you the creeps. I think we may reasonably assume they're McKinnon ancestors. Do you notice something odd about them? Well, both of the men are smiling. If you call that smiling, looks more like leering to me. <laughs> Whatever it is, it shows their teeth. Notice the abnormal length of the eye teeth? Quite sure, yes. And the teeth marks on the dead sheep dog. Quite. Who he is. Black Angus seems to be living up to his name. I'm sorry, gentlemen, but the lair will not see you. He asks that you please leave at once. That's a bit of an understatement. You may tell him we're not leaving here until we've seen Mr. David McKinnon. I'm sorry, Just sir, Just a but... moment. I'm David McKinnon. You are splendid. We've come here on behalf of... I know why you're here, gentlemen. I must ask that you leave at once. But Miss Victor, your fiancé... After all, you know gentlemen, you... Gentlemen, you heard my father's message. Please go. As for Miss Victor, I have no interest in hearing anything concerning her. Good day. 
Come, Watson. I think perhaps our visit was ill-timed. This way, please, gentlemen. Let's get away from here. Unprincipled young care David. I'd like to give him a good thrashing. It might be interesting to talk to David McKinnon when he's away from the influence of Black Angus. Oh, you're wasting your time, Holmes. A man's a bounder. Besides, they'll never let us in the house again. By the front door, true. However, we can still try the back. Leave your hat and coat in the bushes here, old chap. Rumple up your hair, dirty your face, and adopt that delightful Scottish dialect of yours. For the moment, we will be plumbers. Plumbers? How do we know they need plumbers? In an old castle like this, you can always be sure of one fact. Something must inevitably be wrong with the drains. They always need plumbers. But Holmes, do you think it's safe? I mean, if Black Angus discovers us, he may be dangerous. I'm afraid that's a chance we'll have to take. Come along, Watson, and try to look as much like a plumber as possible. <laughs> In just a moment, Dr. Watson will continue the story of Black Angus. But first, here's something which should certainly interest you men about Kreml hair tonic. Kreml is one of the greatest improvements ever made in the history of hair tonics. It's been especially developed to keep dry, unruly hair in perfect order all day long, always looking its best with a nice, rich luster. Yet Kreml never gives hair that objectionable, greasy, patent leather look. That kind of hair went out of style with handlebar mustaches. No, Kreml goes in for modern, handsome hair grooming. And it does lots more than just keep hair looking handsome. Kreml removes dandruff flakes. It also promptly relieves itching of dry scalp and leaves the scalp feeling so clean and alive. May I suggest that tomorrow, when you're out for your Sunday walk or drive, you stop and buy a bottle of Kreml at any drug counter. It's spelled K-R-E-M-L, Kreml Hair Tonic. Now, Dr. Watson, did you and Sherlock Holmes manage to get into McKinnon Castle disguised as plumbers? We did, Mr. Bell. Holmes is right about the drains. We were welcomed at the service entrance with open arms, figuratively speaking. Of course, we, we were shown down to the basement and left to our own devices. As soon as the coast was clear, I found myself following Sherlock Holmes as he stealthily mounted an, an old stone stairway. I must confess that my heart was in my mouth. This stairway should lead us up to the east wing, I'd say. By the way, Watson, you make a most convincing plumber. Oh, really? I was rather good at charge, you know. <laughs> Quiet, Watson. There's a light under that door. The door is slightly ajar. Come here, Watson. We can see through the crack. The man seated in front of the dressing table, staring into the mirror. Candlelight's flickering, but I'll give you odds that's black angles. Oh, I don't like this, Holmes. I don't like it. He met... Holmes, he's got a revolver. He's raising it. Angus McKinnon, put down that revolver. Who the devil are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I told Bruce to throw you out. This time I'll do it myself, send you prying... Mr. McKinnon... I know what you were thinking when you raised that revolver to your temple just now. And believe me, you're wrong. You can't possibly know. I think I do. You are convinced that you have been killing these sheepdogs. You have been so preoccupied with the legends of your great ancestor, Wolfhound McKinnon, that you think that your brain has snapped and that you've turned into a vampire. You're right, Mr. Holmes. But how you found out is beyond me. You know about the dogs? The sheep dogs with their throats torn out? Yes, we know about them. In fact, we found one as we were driving out about a mile from here. I know. They brought me the news not more than two hours ago. It won't happen again. You're convinced that you are responsible for these killings? What else can I think? All the evidence, the blood stains on my cloak. And I know those stains are not caused by human blood. You remember nothing? Nothing. But when I think of the heritage of the McKinnons... How can I doubt? Then that's the reason your son was recalled from London yesterday. It is. You suddenly had proof of what you thought to be your own morbid tendencies. And so you sent a message to your only son, warning him that he must not allow the woman he loved to marry into a family stained with madness. Holmes, you seem to understand my problem. But I will not discuss it with you. Go away, both of you. A McKinnon cannot go to his maker before strangers. Mr. McKinnon... Give me your help in a few hours, Grace, and I'm convinced I can prove to you that you're the victim of a devilish plot. A plot? 
I don't understand. Oh, come now, Mr. McKinnon. In this year of grace, it's a little hard to believe in vampires. But how can you disprove the evidence I've seen with my own eyes? The human teeth marks. It wouldn't be hard to conceive of an instrument that could simulate those marks, Mr. McKinnon. But who could think of such a fiendish plan? And what would be the motive? I have a suspicion. But what's more important at the immediate moment is to find the evidence. An instrument such as I've suggested would be damning proof. Therefore, it would be hidden in the most obscure hiding place in the castle. Now, what would be the most secret place? The cellars? Aye, we have extensive cellars. We'll search them. But another possibility occurs to me. In castles as old as this, there's often a secret room. Or, as they were sometimes called, a priest's hole. You're quite right, Mr. Holmes. We have such a hiding place here, though I haven't been in it for years. A narrow stairway leads down between the walls from an entrance behind that big cabinet. Splendid, Mr. McKinnon. You have a lantern? There, on the dressing table. I'll light it, Holmes. Thank you, Watson. I have a strong suspicion that the solution of the postponed wedding ceremony, as well as that of the mangled dogs, lies at the foot of that secret stairway. Stuffy little place. Festooned with cobwebs. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Let's walk to do another one. Nobody's been down here recently, Holmes. I'd swear to that. Give me the lantern, Watson, will you? Uh, there you are, fellow. Thanks. Uh-huh. Look here in the dust on the floor. Footprints. Footprints leading to that old chest in the, in the corner over there. Yes. Doesn't seem to be locked. <laughs> Look, Mr. McKinnon. See this devil's instrument? Oh, what is it? It looks like a metal trap. It is, with jaws of steel and a powerful spring. Oh, good heavens! And you can see the recent bloodstains on it. This fiendish instrument gives us the answer to those poor dead dogs. You mean that this was used to tear up their throats? Undoubtedly. And look, more devil's work. Great Scott, a human jawbone with the teeth intact. This must have been used to leave the prints of human teeth after the animals were dead. And to try and make me think that I was mad. The devils! Oh, sorry. Where are you? Somebody shot, the, somebody shot the lantern out of my hand. You're too inquisitive, Sherlock Holmes. Humphreys. Yes, Angus, your cousin, Humphreys. We've found out, Humphreys. I know what you and your meddling friends have found out, Angus. Thoughtful of you to put yourselves in my power. A priest dungeon will make a perfect coffin for the three of you. I'm going to lock and bolt this door at the head of the stairs. It's your only escape. I'm afraid death by suffocation and starvation won't be very pleasant, my friend. I'm friends, I'm coming back up those stairs. I'm going to get my hands on you. Your step, Angus, and I fire. Your devil, I'm I warned you. Oh, Watson, where are you? I'm here, sir. How is he? I'm all right, Holmes. I think the shot just grazed me. I'll strike a match. Yes. Just a flesh wound as far as I can see. Good. McKinnon, is there another exit from this room? There is, Mr. Holmes. Under that chest, the stone slides out. Gracious me, but Humphreys said... Humphreys knows nothing about it. Some secrets of the McKinnon family are only interested to those bearing the family name. Thank heaven for that. And I'd suggest we get out of here as soon as possible. The air in here is getting stale already. Lean on me, Mr. McKinnon. That's it. How are you feeling? A little shaky, but I'm all right, Mr. Holmes. We're in blazes, are we? We've been following this little passage up and down, round and round. Right now we're behind the wall of the library. The entrance is ahead of us, concealed by a tapestry. Shh! There's a faint crack of light. We're behind the tapestry. Someone's in the library. Oh, boy, I don't know how to say this. It's Humphreys. And my son, David. Shh! Listen. I was worried about those men from London. Sherlock Holmes should learn of the shame of the McKinnon's. David, I'm afraid I've got shocking news for you. Your father has confessed that he has been killing the sheepdog. Father? He knows that he's mad. He, he left the castle just now with a pistol. He plans to kill himself. Kill himself? We must stop him. No, 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 my boy. Let him go. It's the best way. Oh, poor father. 
What can I do? There's only one honorable solution, David. Your branch of the family is corrupt, decayed. If your father dies and you disappear, the estate reverts to me, and we can save the McKinnon name with fresh blood. But, Uncle... You can go to the colonies and start life over with a new name. It's the only way. We've heard enough. Come on. Compress, you lion devil fire. They said the... Drop that revolver, Humphrey. Drop it or I'll shoot. We overheard your conversation, Mr. Humphreys. Most enlightening. And we found this where you headed, you filthy beast. A human jawbone. You'd marked the dogs with it and tried to make me think that I'd done it the sun. Then what he told me in London was nothing but a pack of lies. Of course. Mr. McKinnon, I suggest you send for the police. The police? What crime can they hold me for? A few sheepdogs killed and they can't prove I was responsible. There's... There's a, there's a mob of people outside the window. Mr. McKinnon, sir, excuse me. What is it, Bruce? It's a crowd of the villagers. They're in an ugly mood. They say you're responsible for the sheepdogs being killed on the moors. They're threatening to burn the castle. I'm afraid they're getting out of hand. Go back and tell them that in a few minutes I'll come out and explain the killings. Aye, sir, aye. But in a way too long. I'll go and talk to them, Father. They know me. Mr. Humphreys, possibly the law can do little to you. But the violence of mob rule may prove strikingly effective. Aye, I'll take this blackguard Humphreys out there. They'll know what to do with him. No, 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 you can't do that. You've got to keep me away from them. They tear me to pieces. Sign a written confession, Mr. Humphreys, and we'll protect you. I'll sign anything. Just keep me away from that mob. You suggested that my boy should go to the colonies. Put it in writing that you'll do just that yourself. Give me a pen. Here you are. And now, Watson, I think we still have time to catch the night express for London. I hope we'll have no difficulty in obtaining three tickets on such short notice. Three tickets? Of course. I'm certain young David McKinnon will be accompanying us. I fancy we may be attending a wedding within a very few days. And did you, Dr. Watson? Did I... did I what? Attend the wedding. <laughs> Indeed we did, Mr. Bell. As a matter of fact, Holmes acted as best man. It was a very charming affair. <laughs> I'm sure it was. And now, Dr. Watson, what about next week? Well, now, let me see. What shall I tell you? Next week, I think I'll tell you a story called The Adventure of the Hungry Cat, in which Sherlock Holmes saves an innocent man from the gallows and brings to justice... A particularly vicious and cold-blooded murderer. Now, here's something which should interest you ladies. My wife has beautiful, natural highlights in her hair. And girls, I'll let you in on the secret of how she does it. I always wash my hair with cremel shampoo. It leaves my hair with a natural, glossy luster that lasts for days and days. Cremel shampoo actually brings out all the natural, glossy highlights that lie concealed in the hair. In addition, it has a beneficial oil base that helps keep hair from becoming dry or brittle. This famous hard water shampoo works like magic in every type of water. And girls, you'll love the way its rich, luxurious foam penetrates right to the scalp. And removes all loose dandruff flakes as well as the dirt. Don't forget, Cremel Shampoo is the same beautifying shampoo which those famous million dollar powers models use. So why not glamour bathe your hair with beautifying Cremel Shampoo? Tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure was suggested by an incident in Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story, The Sussex Vampire. Nigel Bruce appeared by permission of California Pictures and Tom Conway through the courtesy of Eagle Lion Pictures. This is Joseph Bell speaking for Kremel Hair Tonic and Kremel Shampoo and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time when Dr. Watson will tell us about the adventure of the hungry cat. <laughs> is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Cerebral Cinema hopes you have enjoyed this movie of the mind.